Viv, are we ready to go? Yes, Tian. Okay. Good morning, colleagues. COVID-19 con COVID conversations are brought to you by the African Alliance with support from the South African Medical Research Council and the Department of Science and Innovation and the Vaccine Advocacy Resource Group, which is 100% funded by activists. We bring you these calls in partnership with the Community Constituency COVID-19 Front, the Treatment Action Campaign and APA. These calls take place every Thursday at 10 a.m. and seek to bridge the divide between civil society and those who hold power and platform in the COVID-19 space. All of our recordings, along with the transcript and the Q&A sessions can be found at africanalliance.org.za. We encourage pre-submitted questions and welcome questions or comments in the chat box during the call, and we will do our best to answer all of them. Those we do not get to, we will reach out to our guest after the call to secure those answers and those will be included in the transcript. Today, we speak about COVID-19 vaccines and the search for equity in an unequal world. We are joined by Safura Abdul Karim, a public health lawyer and senior researcher at the Witt School of Public Health and a 2020 Aspen New Voices Fellow. She's also a member of the Africa CDC's African Vaccine Delivery Alliance, which aims to support the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines across the continent. Sapura completed a Bachelor of Laws degree at the University of Cape Town and thereafter a Master of Laws degree in Global Health Law at Georgetown University. She's currently pursuing her PhD in Law at the University of KwaZulu-Natal on constitutional rights and non-communicable diseases. Prior to joining Priceless SA, Sapura completed her articles at a major corporate firm, acted as a public defender and clerk for Justice Leona Tehran at the Constitutional Court of South Africa. Sakura has also worked at notable health law organizations, such as the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids and the O'Neill Institute, as well as being a legal journalist at Ground Up. Her work at Priceless SA focuses on prevention and control of non-communicable diseases, as well as using the law to improve health outcomes more broadly. Sakura has written on a number of issues concerning COVID-19 and law, including equitable access, to a COVID-19 vaccine, the effects of criminalizing SARS-CoV-2 transmission on testing efforts, and the role of human rights during the COVID-19 pandemic. Safura, thank you so much for spending time with us this morning and being available and willing to share some of your insights and perspectives on issues of equity and access to a COVID-19 vaccine. I'll hand over to you now to spend the next minute 20 minutes speaking to us about some of your work before we engage in a question and answer session. So thank you again and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's really a privilege to be here speaking to all of you and I hope that some of my thoughts and insights will be helpful as you think about how to move forward and make COVID-19 vac vaccine access a reality for everybody on the continent. Vaccine inequity is something that's quite historical. Sometimes I say it's existed for as long as vaccines have existed. And the reason I raise that is because sometimes there's this intense kind of COVID exceptionalism. And I just think it's important to highlight that this issue of poorer countries struggling to get access to a vaccine is historic. It's not specific to COVID. And so we can draw a lot of lessons from our mistakes in the past and learn about how to do it going forward. Because really, this issue and COVID, the attention that is being paid to a COVID-19 vaccine is actually an opportunity for all of us to fix what is essentially a broken system, to address these systemic historical issues and make vaccine access equitable, not just for COVID-19, but for all conditions and all health issues globally. So this is a very complicated issue. And my training, as you've heard, is as a lawyer. So I'm not going to speak about things like supply chain logistics and prioritization. I just want to focus on some key legal issues that have emerged over the last year and kind of talk about how those might translate in the future. Because in my mind, there are almost two phases of COVID-19 vaccine inequity. There's the phase we're currently in, and that phase is characterized by a lack of supply, by a shortage of doses. But at some point in the future, we're going to have enough doses to vaccinate the people who need to be vaccinated globally. And then vaccine inequality, if 
history has taught us anything, is going to shift from being about who was able to get the vaccine doses first to who's able to pay the most for them. And so I think as we're beginning to think about what kinds of activities we can be involved in, what kinds of solutions we can find to this problem. We need to not only think about the current situation we're in and what has caused our current situation, but also how to address the future problems we might face. So I just will start by outlining the current phase we're in, because to my mind, it's characterized by kind of two issues. There have been two kind of aspects and ways in which countries have conducted themselves that's led to very serious vaccine hoarding, vaccine nationalism, and ultimately inequity and inequality in the COVID-19 vaccine access. The first thing is because vaccine doses were limited and prior to that, there wasn't even a vaccine. The vaccine, the vaccine doses ultimately went to whoever was going to be willing to take the biggest risks. So at the outset in about February, March last year, when the virus was sequenced and people started developing vaccines, a lot of very wealthy countries began to fund the development of vaccines. That's led to us having an unprecedented number unprecedented number of candidates in the pipeline. I mean, there's nearly 300 different vaccine candidates for COVID-19. But when countries were funding the development of that vaccine, they didn't do it as an act of generosity. Taxpayer funding went into billions and billions of dollars of taxpayer funding went into developing these vaccines, but there was a string attached to that funding. In many, many instances, the, the sort of condition of giving this funding was that the country giving the funding would be able to secure preferential access to those doses, typically at a lower price than otherwise would be offered. And that was almost to the exclusion of other countries, provided that, of course, the vaccine worked. Now, it was sort of unexpected that we'd have so much success in the candidate, early candidates. So countries were funding 10 or 12 candidates with the expectation that they'd be lucky if one had worked. However, because there's been such success in the current in, in the results released so far, what we've seen is that some countries who entered into what are called advanced market commitments that were attached to their funding have now almost oversubscribed for doses. You have Canada who has effectively procured enough doses or um, is entitled to procure enough doses to vaccinate five times their population. So that's the one aspect is that's tied up a lot of the limited supply, but it's also meant that the countries that could afford to lose the money if the, out of the 10 candidates, nine of them didn't work. The, the countries that were able to pour a lot of money into this with the potential that it might not work ended up being favored in terms of getting vaccine access first. Then what happened was that after vaccine candidates were found to be safe, what we saw is that middle income countries began to engage in their own type of vaccine hoarding and vaccine nationalism. So the countries that were guaranteed access from the developers um, when the vaccines were found to be effective kind of had that guarantee that they could wait for efficacy results. And as soon as the efficacy results were released, they'd get the first doses. What countries like the United Arab Emirates and Morocco began to do was to approve the vaccines and emergency use authorization without phase three data. What that meant is that they didn't have to compete with other countries that were waiting to know if the vaccines were effective. So they were willing to take a, a smaller gamble, which is to purchase vaccines without the guarantee that those vaccines would actually work. That left behind poorer countries that couldn't afford to take even that risk. So then you saw kind of almost two tiers in vaccine inequality because you had wealthy countries able to procure and monopolize doses of highly effective vaccines. You had this middle tier of middle income countries that were still able to afford to purchase vaccines at a price and kind of took the risk of not waiting to see if the vaccines were effective, getting those doses and really the bottom echelon of countries that were not willing to take those risks or not even able to pay for the doses themselves left waiting. And a lot of those countries were then relying on COVAX. And we know that COVAX is only beginning to roll out doses in March. So if you think about this, it's meant that there's been a six month delay for some of these countries who decided to participate in COVAX in getting vaccine access. Even delays are a form of vaccine in inequity. So the second, I just now wanna move on to the second phase and what we can expect in the future, because what where we are now 
is that the doses are being monopolized by countries that have pursued one of the two strategies I outlined. But what's going to happen in the future once those wealthy countries have vaccinated their populations where there's enough doses because people have invested in manufacturing capacity, so now low and middle income countries can produce their own vaccines? Well, that's when issues of intellectual property, know-how, and sort of general corporate interest in making profits come in. You see, up until now, there's been this sort of veil of a COVID-19 vaccine is a public good. And so countries and companies should not be profiting of it, off of it. Now, because there's been such limited supply, these issues haven't come to the fore, although we've seen that some countries are paying slightly more for a vaccine, some paying slightly less. But going forward, how will companies determine who should get access? One would like to think that that it will be on the basis of equity. But if we look historically, we can see that many companies have chosen to price their vaccines completely out of range for poorer countries. And they've used intellectual property protections to ensure that they maintain a monopoly over this type of vaccine so that they can generate a profit from it. They've justified this on the basis that they took the risk to develop the, the vaccine, they, took the R they bore the cost of the R&D, and so they should be able to profit from it. But as I mentioned previously, a lot of these vaccines have actually been funded using taxpayer money and public funds. So that argument doesn't exactly hold. The other thing is that previously, this has led to vaccine inequality because certain conditions interventions to prevent or treat those conditions haven't been as well funded as conditions that affect primarily high income countries. So there's kind of a multitude of issues where like, for example, vaccines that are perhaps more feasible for low and middle income countries may not be pursued because there are vaccines that work very well for high income countries. So we need to ensure that A, we have sufficient measures in place to avoid IP created monopolies that low and middle income countries can choose to produce vaccines if they have the capacity, or at least that they have leverage to negotiate lower prices with the pharmaceutical companies that develop these vaccines. And we also need to ensure that even if those very wealthy pharmaceutical companies choose to not pursue more feasible vaccine candidates, that there's a way for that development to be incentivized and pursued within low and middle income countries so that the vaccine is the vaccine that's ultimately rolled out makes sense for our context so the it, the that that kind of is the is the next phase um, of of what the big challenge are the challenges will be for, for from a legal perspective going forward for COVID-19 vaccine access. There's a second underlying issue which I won't go into in too much detail, but that is related to vaccine hesitancy. And we've seen that there's very high levels of vaccine hesitancy, and that's also going to impede rollout. And the fact that there's a lack of information, the fact that there's um, different ideological issues, that the cultural acceptability of the vaccine is compromised, that usually follows fault lines of inequality. It usually follows fault lines of people who are marginalized already being further marginalized. And so I think when we're thinking about vaccine inequality, we shouldn't remove that, that part of the equation from our thought process. So I just want, I've outlined some of the problems. I want to talk now about what the solutions are because we've had some efforts to solve these problems. These problems have existed, as I mentioned, for years and years and years, but even within the context of COVID, since March last year, there have been efforts to try and address these problems. The first is that we tried to do self-regulation. So we said, okay, pharmaceutical companies, you're pledging that you're gonna ensure that there's equitable access to your vaccine. You're pledging that you're not going to rush to approve vaccines that don't have complete phase three data. And for example, Pfizer joined in on those pledges. But as soon as there is the preliminary results showed that the Pfizer vaccine was effective, they immediately pushed for emergency use authorization despite a previous pledge that said that they would not. So we can see that broadly self-regulation is not working because the pharmaceutical developers are prioritizing access for wealthier countries. They are pursuing bilaterals with upper high income and upper middle income countries to the exclusion of poorer countries. And vaccine equity within this context has been limited to small donations, 
the Serum Institute of India, who's producing some vaccines, and that even Serum Institute's capacity is limited to the AstraZeneca vaccine. They were given a license to do so. So it's all within the existing rubric of IP protection, of IP created monopolies. There were certain global efforts that also were, were attempted to be implemented to try and address some of these problems. An example is COVAX, which we've heard a lot about. And the idea of COVAX is that it would be, it would build on the pneumococcal advanced market commitment. Now that pneumococcal advanced market commitment was quite successful because Previous research showed that the time from a product being registered in a high income country to its rollout in a, in a low or middle income country could be between four and seven years. The pneumococcal AMC that was created by Gabby shrank that time to a year. So it was a good model to begin with. However, the issues with COVAX are largely that they've had a participation problem. You see the pneumococcal vaccine AMC was funded by wealthy countries, they gave donations, and then low and lower middle income countries were able to participate because they were Gavi eligible and they would just get the vaccine either for free or at a highly subsidized rate. Now, many countries who are participating in the COVAX advanced market commitment are self-financing their involvement. So for example, countries like South Africa. And we are paying the same for our participation in COVAX as, for example, the European Union. Now, that's not vaccine equity, that's just vaccine equality. If we get to pay the same amount despite having a much lower GDP and being able to afford it a much, at a much lower rate than the EU, then that's not vaccine equity. There's also a governance problem with COVAX because it's entirely run by a private organization. So it's not really participatory, it's not transparent, people don't understand how decisions are being made, they're choosing who can join, they're choosing what vaccines to procure, and there's no kind of negotiation room. Um, the other issue is that there have been delays and there's just broadly been a participation problem with COVAX. Countries that have oversubscribed to doses with bilaterals have chosen to withdraw from COVAX or are choosing to pursue those bilaterals instead of remaining in COVAX. The countries that have oversubscribed and have too many doses are not donating the extra doses to COVAX. So COVAX, for all that it's got, is supposed to cover a huge portion of the population and is able to make vaccines access in theory a reality its execution on the ground has been unsuccessful because of a lack of participation from high-income countries there was also an effort by who to create something called CTAP, which would aim to try and address some of the barriers that accompany vaccine production specifically ip and manufacturing know-how but it was voluntary so what you had was a whole lot of really um, low and um, middle income countries participating and countries that actually held the know-how and organizations and companies that actually held the information opting not to participate. So what that shows us in these three examples is that there were some really innovative, creative ways of thinking about vaccine access, but because all of them were voluntary and there was no political will to compel participation from the people who actually hold all the power, these things haven't actually made COVID-19 vaccine access a reality for poor and, and middle income countries. Now, there's a few other mechanisms that are currently being um, piloted, that are being tested, that are in the process of being rolled out. The first is what the African Union has created. So African Union has created a financing mechanism where countries in Africa, can, the AU will bulk purchase and then countries that are member states can take certain allocations of those doses. Now, this is working far better than COVAX in terms of actually translating into access. They anticipate beginning to roll out doses in the next few weeks. And it's also enabled them, they've been more transparent about it. So you can see what types of vaccines are available. You as a member state can elect to, to obtain your allocation. And there's a variety of funding mechanisms that if you as a member state cannot pay upfront for the vaccines, you can use choose an installment option, you can get loan agreements. So it's a solution that's really driven from the region and driven by African countries. So it's kind of slightly better than COVAX, but at the same time, it still relies on A, the pharmaceutical companies being willing to sell the vaccines at an affordable price, and B, member states being able to pay a, a decent amount for those vaccines, uh, being able to pay the negotiated amount. It's not like South Africa will pay more than, for example, 
um, Burkina Faso. So there is still, there remains an equity problem even within the regional mechanisms that have been created by the AU, but that is really what is driving vaccine access in our continent at the moment. It's not global mechanisms, it's a regional one. The second thing that I think is really important um, as a potential solution for the future is something that's currently under consideration at the World Trade Organization. And that's the, 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 the TRIPS IP waiver that's being led by India and South Africa. And what that, that IP waiver is seeking to do is to create to basically have a declaration that the IP protections that create monopolies around, a, for example, a COVID-19 vaccine are waived because of the public health emergency that is this pandemic. What is astounding about this application is that even though people accept that, that COVID-19 is a public health emergency and that a vaccine should in theory be a public good, this um, application is facing immense opposition from wealthy countries. The irony is exacerbated by the fact that those wealthy countries have for the most part already received their vaccine doses. And so they are blocking access for poor countries to get vaccine access in future while preserving their own access. So it's a very troubling issue that I think is not being advocated for at the ground level. And the reason why I mention it specifically in this context and in this forum is because this is not the first time that the TRIPS IP protections have been challenged. About 20 years ago, the, the South African government was trying to make antiretroviral therapy affordable because people were dying because of the astronomical cost of HIV treatment at the time. And what happened was the government, due to um, civil pressure from civil society, began to introduce legislation or laws that would weaken IP protections. In response, 40 of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world filed a case against the South African government and ultimately lost. That didn't just change affordable medicine access for South Africa. It actually ended up changing affordable access, uh, affordable medicines laws and protections globally, because it led to the creation of something called the Doha Declaration, which basically says that in a public health emergency, IP protections can be removed or weakened depending on the severity of the situation. So really, there, ha there is precedent for civil society to drastically change the landscape of access to certain health technologies. It happened 20 years ago and it could happen again now if there is sufficient political will because like I said, the Doha Declaration didn't change things for South Africa, it changed things globally. It just has been difficult to implement in the context of a COVID-19 vaccine for the manufacturing capacity issues that I mentioned at the outset. A lot of the innovations design and predictions designed in the Doha Declaration were contingent upon a country being able to produce a medicine. So it allowed for things like generics and imports and things like that. So without the manufacturing capacity, the existing measures in Doha are not the end all and be all of vaccine access, but they will become that in the future. And so it's very important that this IP waiver request goes through. The final thing I want to talk about uh, when it comes to solutions is something called benefit sharing. Now, benefit sharing can talk about all sorts of things. It really, at an international legal level, began in 2005 when Singapore didn't want to share their sample of the seasonal influenza vaccine. The argument was that they would share it with a high-income country, that high-income country would develop a vaccine that would benefit their population, but Singapore's population would not receive the benefit of that vaccine because it would be too expensive for them to purchase. We've seen in, in many countries, including South Africa, that there are sites that are testing COVID-19 vaccines, but that, that participation in the research, that contribution to the development of that vaccine has not come with any kind of benefit or access to the intervention that was tested here. The exception is, of course, the J&J vaccine that was rolled out from yesterday. And if you think about that example, it's quite incredible because the results of the phase three trial were, were announced less than three weeks ago. So it took three weeks from the announcement of the efficacy results to roll out of the first doses, which is quite incredible. But that was done through using the mechanism of a trial. And so it's very important when we start thinking about what potential solutions are, that we begin building in 
benefits sharing when we're developing these health interventions and ensuring that post the completion of the trial, there is equitable access for countries that participate. It is, I will say, a bit of a double-edged sword because it kind of favors countries that have the ability to conduct research. So the poorest and most um, low resource settings are not going to benefit from this type of arrangement, but it is a component of making vaccine equity um, a reality. So we just need to be cautious when we're thinking about these solutions that we don't exacerbate existing inequalities. The last thing I want to talk about is just about when we're engaging in advocacy and arguing for COVID-19 vaccine access at a country level, I just want to caution people that we shouldn't be exacerbating vaccine inequality and engaging in vaccine nationalism ourselves. So there was a tweet by this epidemiologist called Madhupai, and he described the many flavors of vaccine nationalism. So there's been a temptation to talk about vaccine nationalism as something that high income countries have engaged in to the exclusion of low and middle income countries. And that has been true for things like funding the development, purchasing up all the doses. But as I mentioned, middle income countries have also been engaging in behavior that leverages on their relative power and bargaining power and wealth compared to lower, lower income countries. So the fact that they have the ability to purchase vaccines through bilateral agreements has led to, for example, expediting regulatory approval, also engaging in bilaterals that buy up doses that are available. And there have been calls in the media, even as recently as yesterday, to prevent the export of vaccines from South Africa, for example, because we have vaccine production capacity. There have been calls for South Africa to withdraw from COVAX and instead exclusively pursue bilaterals with manufacturers. And there have been calls for South Africa to reverse its decision to donate AstraZeneca doses that we're not using to the AU. All of these, while they may seem like they are advancing vaccine access for South Africans locally, translate to a lack of vaccine access for poorer countries and to the exclusion of poorer countries. So it's very important to remember that this is a systemic issue, but that and that it is largely driven by high income countries, but that middle income countries can, and especially upper middle income countries, can engage in the same type of exclusionary practices if we're not careful. So when thinking about advocacy, I think it's just important to make sure that we as middle income or upper middle income countries don't do to low income countries what high income countries have done to us. So those are some of my thoughts and an overview of kind of the legal issues and vaccine access. I hope that was helpful and I welcome any questions. Thanks so much, Sapura. Really interesting um, listening to some of those perspectives as well. And, you know, as you were talking, I was just thinking um, about the announcement yesterday with the appointment of Dr. Okonjurela to the top of the WTO. Do you think that represents a potential shift going forward in how global trade impacts access to health services? Do you think that her appointment, apart from the optics, represents a potential for a shakeup? Or do you perhaps think this is simply a different face to an inherently patriarchal, misogynistic, profit-influenced um, entity? So I think it's very important to understand that the World Trade Organization doesn't operate per se in a kind of representative democracy. Um, so even though there are many countries that are members of the WTO, certain countries hold greater weight and greater power in terms of what the WTO actually does. And it's not just the case for the WTO, we see that for the United, certain bodies of the United Nations as well. And so I think it is very important that the WTO is being led by somebody who is from a low and middle income country who understands the issues, but whether that will translate to actual change remains to be seen. What I will say is that in recent years, the WTO, when it comes to tobacco law, control laws, when it comes to labeling laws and improving the quality of food, have started to prioritize public health 
over profits like time and time again. And so I think we're seeing just broadly a shift in how the WTO in engages in the tensions between profit and um, and public health. And we're definitely seeing a shift where people are producing unhealthy commodities. The WTO is allowing countries to protect their citizens. Whether that will extend to biomedical interventions is, is, is unclear at this stage, but we can yeah. hope. Yeah, we can indeed. Um, you know, yesterday, the UN Secretary General really criticized this uneven and unfair distribution um, of COVID-19 vaccines, saying that only 10 countries have administered 75% of all vaccinations globally, and we still have 130 countries who have not received a single dose. And I guess that ties into Nombasa's question. Um, so Nombasa says, so looking at future challenges for COVID-19 vaccines, is it possible to advocate that the vaccines not be patented, but only for public use, so we can have affordable pricing? So I think that's the that's the critical question. I will say that most of the vaccine candidates that are currently um, in, in the pipeline have extensive patents. In fact, I was reading on um, from MSF that the, the expansiveness of the patents that have been filed in respect of certain vaccines have actually discouraged the development of other vaccines because they patented certain platforms or certain proprietary know and so companies that were using similar things actually were there was a chilling effect on their development so there's a very serious issue where there's already a huge wall of patents that are blocking development of, of vaccines that are blocking equitable pricing the doha declaration which is part of trips say it allows countries to for example issue compulsory licenses where a company doesn't want to um, waive its ip rights in the case of a public health emergency um, it is contingent upon somebody being able to then produce that vaccine under compulsory license so that's why before we get we can really leverage on ip um, the affordable medicines ip weakening and ip flexibility we need to ensure that low and low income countries have the ability to produce vaccines at an affordable price. Once they can produce it, we be can begin to use things like parallel imports and compulsory licensing to make sure that a COVID-19 vaccine is affordable. Thanks for that perspective, Sephora. You know, I think you've been speaking a lot about um, the Doha Declaration and how and a lot of where we are today, a lot of the gains that we've made really came out of our collective struggle for antiretrovirals um, and antiretroviral treatment back in the day. Um, and you also mentioned that one of the biggest shortcomings was that a lot of these processes and policies are in place on condition that countries have the ability to manufacture. Now we've heard time and time again that South Africa has at the very least the ability to manufacture up to a thousand um, doses, sorry, a million doses a day. Um, we have that manufacturing capacity and we have had for quite a few years. Why do you think we are here in 2021, despite the gains, despite the movements that we've had in the past? And I mean, if one could compare, I certainly don't think we had the same level of pressure and attention on HIV that we're now seeing with COVID, um, I guess because of the nature of the pandemic. But why aren't we realizing all of these gains that you highlighted? Um, why are we here in 2021 still having this discussion? You know, it's I think it's it's a very it's something I've pondered quite a lot. Um, you know, it's when I when I looked at the Doha Declaration, I, I looked at a meeting that happened about five years after it was passed, and it was a meeting of the ministries um, in Southeast Asia. And in that meeting, which happened now 15 years ago, these ministers raised the issue that a lot of the gains of the Doha Declaration would not be applicable to vaccines. And already at that stage, they were realizing that vaccines were just a different ballpark. And since then, many countries, particularly in Southeast Asia, have struggled to access the HPV vaccine, have struggled to access the pneumococcal vaccine. People have been experiencing these difficulties in accessing vaccines for quite a long time, but 
nobody did anything about it. At the time the Doha Declaration was negotiated, I should add, there were very few vaccines that were under IP protection, which is why it wasn't really considered in the same way. But even, but the fact that five years later it was raised and nobody did anything is, is of concern. And the fact that those, those 15 years ago, people were saying we need to develop manufacturing capacity in low and middle income countries to address this problem and nobody did anything about it is of concern. The cause of it, I think, is something that we saw at the beginning of the pandemic, which is companies are, are put under pressure to ensure vaccine equity. And so they engage in a lot of rhetoric. They say, we're pledging to do this. They engage in voluntary actions. But as soon as it comes down, as soon as the, the rubber meets the road, so to speak, and the vaccine is found to be effective, all of those pledges and voluntary activities fall away. And I think that is the trouble is we've put too much faith in the people who are developing the vaccines to uphold this idea that it's a public good. Whereas we know from our past experience with ARVs, companies don't act that way when the rubber meets the road. They don't actually pursue public good, they pursue their own interests. And it just, it's, it is a shame that we weren't able to advocate more strongly. There were people arguing from the outset last year that we need to make sure that this is a reality. You know, for example, the people's vaccine movement has been advocating for like a free vaccine to be made available, that wealthy countries should fund the development of manufacturing capacity in low and middle income countries. And there are some initiatives, but it's all just a little bit too little, too late. So I think the key now is to make sure that we don't make the problem worse and that we use all this attention on COVID the way that people use the attention on HIV to actually change the system for the better, to make vaccine equity the system, to fix it at a systemic level and make it a reality going forward for future pandemics. It might be a little bit too late for COVID, but it's not too late for everything that will happen in the future. Yeah, um, that's quite a lot. And I think, you know, at the core of it, at least in my mind this morning, is wondering, so what does this mean for communities? You know, you have all of these power brokers and influential and powerful people in these really key platforms. You have pharma, which almost appears to be just going absolutely wild in their traditional lust for profiteering. I'm not sure why we expected anything else. Um, from pharma, and it always just struck me as there was always this expectation of pharma um, to almost do good by the people and not their shareholders, where history shows us, um, you know, they exist to, to please their shareholders and to ensure that the entities they run are profitable. And we saw this when we had the CEO of one of the largest pharma pharmaceutical companies in the world at the outset, when the pandemic was first um, officially declared, saying that they would, you know, they would commit not to make um, any profits from their vaccine. And then, of course, a few months down the line, we saw through a leaked memo where the pharmaceutical company actually said that they would determine when the pandemic is over, in effect dictating how sooner or later they could start generating profits. Then we saw a second CEO characterize civil society and the world's calls for a free vaccine for everyone everywhere as fanatical. Um, he called us radicals. And so in this, in this noise, in the space where there's so much competing interests, you have pharma going after their profits you have scientists and researchers um, working at times for the greater good, at times for, you know, personal glory or the next accolade. You have government officials who are falling over themselves um, to get center stage to position themselves as the bearers of the solution. Amidst all of this jostling, and noise and messaging and power plays and egos. What power do you think communities have to actually make a change in accelerating the realization of access or the, the realization of their 
right to health in this context, um, a COVID-19 vaccine. Because I do get the feeling that while civil society and communities are very clear of our power and our traditional role in holding those to account, in, in holding those in power to account, I do get the feeling that there is a there is a sense of can we really make a difference here? We've seen the cogs and the wheels of this machine move ahead, you know, irrespective of our petitions, our calls for transparency, our appeals for courageous leadership when we saw that we were paying nearly double um, the cost for COVID-19 vaccines in some European countries. And when I asked the Deputy Director General about it, he said that, well, Europe was in a better place to negotiate a discount because of what they had characterized as the levels of research um, and development support they had provided. And it really just made me think about a lot of our vaccine candidates um, that we've trialed in South Africa. These are vaccine candidates that came about as a result of research happening in the universities in this country, in research centers in this country. Um, this is research that was possible because of people in this country who dedicated their time their bodies, their commitments to making the research move forward, our science, our institutions. And while our financial contributions certainly pale in comparison to the rest of the funders of a range of trials, public funds, South African public funds, were used to contribute to make these trials um, move ahead. And so in the midst of all of that, I guess there's just a hunger, apart from a hunger for courageous leadership, because my question was then, well, what did our government do? What did what show of courage did our government display around the negotiating table that paled in comparison to the negotiating power of Europe? And so I think there's a hunger at community level of number one, trying to understand that. So I guess my question is in two parts. The first is where in your view lies the actual power of communities and civil society in the context of this global trade discussion, the, the, the discussions of IP and access and the politicking? And then the second question would be, what are your perspectives on the need to balance the respect, I guess, of the existing non-disclosure agreements that our public representatives have signed versus their accountability to the people. Because a refrain that we've kept on getting was that, oh, well, we've signed an undisclosure agreement, so we can't tell you that, or we can't tell you this. But it constantly occurs to me that surely there has to be some ground where your commitment to falling in line with conditions in the non-disclosure agreement has to be balanced with surely an ethical duty or responsibility to be accountable to the people that have put you in a position of power. So your reflections on those two questions. So I think with the first one, um, I don't think anybody should underestimate their power even now. Because if you think about a few weeks ago, there was a huge outcry for a vaccine. And I've highlighted some of the problems with some of the advocacy calls that emanated from that. But over, overall, that call, that pressure, resulted in South Africa getting vaccines very quickly. And even if, if, even if those negotiations had been in the pipeline for months and months, which they probably were to some extent, the reality is, at a minimum, that public pressure forced disclosure and it forced transparency and it enabled us to understand what the what actually the situation was so even just at a local level you can see how community grassroots um, engagement grassroots pressure in activism can really change the landscape very very quickly and i think it's just important to understand that we spend so much time being in direct opposition to government that Sometimes when you're working with a global system 
your advocacy objective should be to maybe consider supporting some of what government is doing. So for example, the IP waiver is something that public support at a grassroots level could really change the outcome of that waiver because it changed things previously, even though you think, oh, we're just in South Africa, we're just at a local level. The ARV activism changed it, the WTO's own understanding of what IP protection should mean in public health emergencies. So there is precedent in that instance to when working in concert with government, because remember, it was the Treatment Action Campaign and other civil society organizations in tandem with government's actions to introduce laws that would make ARVs more more affordable than translating to global change. We set an example in South Africa, and if we do it right, the rest of the continent can follow that example and benefit. So, you know, I won't purport to say what the most important issues are, but even what has been done so far from a community perspective, that has had an impact on how our COVID response looks, how vaccine access looks. I mean, if you just think about even with the lockdown restrictions, it was communities arguing for greater respect of their, their religious rights that led to certain flexibilities. You know, it was the, uh, the backlash against Colin Causa's death that changed how the SADF and the SAPs engaged with people who are violating lockdown. It hasn't been perfect, but even incremental changes can have a huge impact. So whether we're talking about this kind of hopeless system of global inequity, or whether we're talking about issues that are at a micro level, any kind of advocacy actually has had, it, had an impact on how we deal with COVID. And I don't think we should undermine that. Um, the second question around non-disclosure agreements, it's, it's such a tricky question because you're right, there's this need to be transparent and there has been the sense that these NDAs are almost becoming like a curtain that people can hide behind and they can you know, choose not to provide any updates because there's a blank this blanket NDA and we don't know what's happening, which fuels mistrust, which then in turn fuels a whole lot of other problems, including vaccine hesitancy. However, the risk that we run with compelling disclosure <clears throat> and saying to government, you can't have NDAs, is that pharmaceutical companies will choose to leave the negotiating table. So this is another instance where global solidarity would have made a huge difference. The EU was able to compel the disclosure of certain documents that AstraZeneca had, the certain contracts that AstraZeneca had with other countries because they acted in solidarity. And so I think maybe it's also important for us to leverage on regional instruments and say, as a group, the AU is going to mandate that agreements be disclosed. And that way, you can't have the, the companies backing off from every negotiating table because they don't want to disclose things. Because really, these NDAs are not designed to protect anybody's interests, but the companies that are negotiating, because it's really about protecting price sensitive information. So it's about their profits and their bottom line and margins. So although our government is upholding the NDA because they want to act in our interest and in that they want to have companies come to the negotiating table and negotiate, we should actually be taking more of a stance globally about what, the, what purpose these NDAs actually serve, because they don't serve a public purpose. Purpose. They serve a profit purpose. And so I think if we could, like the EU has, put pressure as a, as a block, as a regional block, then maybe that could translate into disclosure, disclosure of information without compromising our ability to negotiate and procure vaccine doses, for example. Mm. Yeah, that's very interesting. Well, a question that is coming to my mind as you're speaking is then the issue of So Johnson & Johnson arrived yesterday, we're going to roll out those half a million um, jabs. Of course, these are free, characterized as an implementation study, which in itself is problematic in terms of perceptions and hesitancy. Um, so a lot of questions are coming up around that. But as this vaccine rollout happens, whether phase one, two, or an eventual phase three, likely at the end of 2022 or early 2023, what are your concerns, if any, around the fact that this will happen in a country like ours that is world-renowned for its Afrophobia, 
and its deep and intense hatred for people from the region. Um, in terms of how access to a vaccine will happen, specifically for those who are undocumented in, in the country and how that manifests. Some of the discussions we've been having really point to potential play-ups in Afrophobia that we've seen in the past, when perhaps the perception is that those who do not hold a South African identification document would be accessing a vaccine at times before those who do hold a South African identification document who regard their right to access the vaccine as a priority over anyone else. What are your thoughts and reflections around how that might manifest if you feel it might manifest at all? So there's no question in my mind because the Afrophobia that exists in South Africa is not something that's simply ideological in the public. We've seen it translated into government endorsed policies. If you look at the NHI document, that is the NHI bill, which is so sparse on detail, outlines in great detail how people who are not South African, who are not who are undocumented, will not be able to access certain services. Now that is a clear communication from government that their priority, you know, in this NHI bill that had almost no information, they wanted people to know that if you're undocumented, you're not going to reap the benefits of NHI. So I have no doubt that these issues issues will manifest in policies unless there's huge activism and political pressure and just in general a rejection of this afrophobia in the public because it's it's not just something that happens in the public in the communities it's something that is in being endorsed by government and being perpetuated by government policies and there is a big issue around rollout and equity in general in south africa and that's because of the fact that healthcare capacity is concentrated in air in wealthier areas like in general there's more services provided to wealthier people and there's an intersection there around race and gender and class and to some extent citizenship and so what we'll see there unless there's active active work to try and undo those existing inequalities, you'll see them translate into the rollout. You'll see that there's more appointments available in wealthier areas than in poorer areas, which means that people in wealthier areas are going to be able to get more vaccine access because they're going to be able to book their appointments sooner. So, And even if you think about, for example, the seasonal influenza vaccine, more than half the doses of the vaccine are administered in the public sector. The public sorry, the private sector. The public sector doesn't administer very many flu vaccines in general. So if you see, if you think about that, the, the, just the public-private divide is going to cause a problem. And of course, that has intersection with undocumented people. So there's a lot of concerns I have from an equality and human rights perspective about how to ensure that the prioritization post phase two is respectful of human rights, is not discriminating against people who are undocumented, is not discriminating on the basis of income or race. And because all of these things are so tied to geography and because the infrastructure has been through, you know, decades and decades of apartheid being entrenched along those geographic and racial lines, there needs to be a concerted effort to think through how we can ensure that the vaccine rollout doesn't discriminate against certain groups of people who are marginalized and in particular is respectful for, of human rights. And like I said, that's really about changing the way in which we determine how people access healthcare, shifting it from being about geography and about income to being about broader access. And I mean, it's, the tr it's true for even the NHI, which was using people's addresses to determine where their healthcare provider is situated. As soon as it's tied to geography, there's immediately a problem in South Africa. And I think we need a concerted effort to think about allocation outside the bounds of geography to make it equitable. I don't know if that answers your question. It does, thank you. And I think it leads into, into my final question, which is really around this concept of mandatory testing. There's been a lot of talk around the potential um, for mandatory testing, specifically for healthcare professionals. And 
you know, in a country like ours, where we've got this dual healthcare system, where those who are mainly white um, and upper class and wealthy are able to access this world class healthcare system, and those who are not still have to face the violence of the public health system. It's been just over a year now when the CG released the report, which showed us how several women were forcibly sterilized um, after being suspected of having HIV. So we've got this inherent mistrust, inherent inequality, inherent violence that has characterized the healthcare system in this country. What are your thoughts in that context of potential mandatory testing that has so far been packaged as for the public good and one of the only ways that we will achieve population immunity? So I think people often ask me about mandatory vaccination. Um, I think it's because they think the lawyers, that's their go-to. Um, and I think that, you know, there is infrastructure in place to compel vaccination and to make vaccinations mandatory for groups of people. Um, but I also acknowledge that President Ramaphosa has expressly rejected the use of the law in that way. And I think that as somebody who's in public health, I support that because if healthcare workers are reluctant to take a vaccine, then we need to think about what is the underlying cause of that vaccine hesitancy. It's not enough to say to people, you have to do it because we're telling you to do it. And if you don't do it, you're gonna be imprisoned or given a fine. The criminal law is quite a blunt instrument. It just forces people to do things. It doesn't generate buy-in. It just generates fear and it exacerbates mistrust. So for me, from a public health perspective, compelled vaccination is not the answer. The answer is to create a, an environment that is supportive of vaccination, that incentivizes vaccination, that has respect for people's rights, and that really tries to generate buy-in, that tries to understand why people are reluctant and address those fears rather than just ignoring them. And so things like immunity passports, encouraging uh, or requiring vaccination before kids go to school, well, and then also saying to people, if you work in an environment where you have to be vaccinated because you're at high risk and no accommodations can be made for you, then you need to take a vaccine. But if you're not working in that environment, we'll try and make accommodations in so far as possible. Those are all the steps that I see as getting us to a level of population immunity, of getting us to a level of herd immunity. Just using the blunt instrument of do it or else is going to disproportionately affect low, lower income and marginalized groups. It's going to exacerbate mistrust in the system. And it's not going to actually achieve what you're trying to achieve because enforcing something like this is almost impossible. And we've seen that with the lockdown as well. A large reason why the lockdown worked and the hard lockdown worked is because people bought into it. They believed that it was necessary. And so I think it's really about ensuring that you're, that there's sufficient levels of education that you're combating misinformation, and most importantly, that you're understanding people's concerns and being responsive to them, rather than undermining them and disregarding their concerns. That's the only way you're gonna get buy-in at a population level for vaccination and achieve those goals of population immunity, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Colleagues, today we spoke to Safura Abdul Karim, a public health lawyer and senior researcher at the Witt School of Public Health and a 2020 Aspen New Voices Fellow, and also a member of the Africa CDC's African Vaccine Delivery Alliance, which aims to support the rollout of COVID-19 vaccines across the continent. Safura, thank you again so much for joining us. It's been such an insightful discussion, and we certainly hope to continue the discussion online as the weeks roll by and as our vaccination program gets underway and so it's always great to chat to you and thank you again for making the time thank you so much for having me and i wish everybody all the luck as you start making vaccine access a reality for us thank you so much and thank you to everyone who has joined us we'll speak to you next week thursday at the same time thanks everyone <laughs>